In 1917, the British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour wrote to the wealthy British banker and Zionist Lord Rothschild. His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This short letter had no legal status, but was later incorporated within the terms of Britain's mandate for Palestine, and thus it became one of the most significant documents leading eventually to the creation of the State of Israel and the ongoing quagmire of the Israel-Palestine conflict. From the outset, it was controversial. The prominent British Jewish politician of the day, Sir Edwin Montagu, opposed it vigorously. Later, when the language of the Balfour Declaration was included in the mandate for Palestine, the House of Lords voted to reject this in a motion passed by 60 to 29 and on the grounds that the declaration was opposed to the wishes of the great majority of the people of Palestine. Yet Balfour himself wrote in 1919, in Palestine we do not propose even to go through the form of consulting the wishes of the present inhabitants of the country. The four great powers are committed to Zionism, and Zionism, be it right or wrong, good or bad, is rooted in age-long traditions, in present needs, in future hopes, of far profounder import than the desires and prejudices of the 700,000 Arabs who now inhabit that ancient land. Despite the facts on the ground, and the opposition to it, this promise made by Arthur Balfour would lead to the British mandate, mass Jewish immigration, and eventually to the creation of Israel in the wake of the Second World War and the Holocaust. In 1948, it also led to the Palestinian Nakba, meaning catastrophe, when more than 750,000 Palestinians were forcefully expelled from a land they had inhabited from antiquity, and with a further 500,000 managing to remain behind in spite of the terror unleashed by Zionism. Israel, created as a consequence of British colonialism, was formed in a similar way to the South African state, and both have segregation, apartheid, at their heart. In 1976, Egyptian scholar and writer Abdul Wahab El Masiri wrote Israel and South Africa, the progression of a relationship, one of the earliest works to compare Zionism with apartheid. He compared Britain's aims in creating the Union of South Africa in 1909 and the Balfour Declaration of 1917 and pointed out that both began as settlement enclaves serving Western interests in exchange for support and protection. And the apartheid character of Israel was noted by South African Prime Minister Dr Henrik Verwood when in 1961 he said, the Jews took Israel from the Arabs after the Arabs had lived there for a thousand years. Israel, like South Africa, is an apartheid state. There are amazing similarities between apartheid South Africa and what more and more people today are regarding as apartheid Israel. Their coincidences, there are date milestones which are amazing. Of course it's the essence that's the important aspect. And why Israel reminds South Africans from Archbishop Desmond Tutu to struggle heroes who visit uh, the occupied territories. First of all, very clear 
this is worse than apartheid. Real guts, the substance of apartheid and discrimination. It starts with the whole philosophical aspect, the world view. And both the Afrikaners and the white settlers who follow in South Africa use biblical terms, like a lot of Christian Zionists today in fact do. Uh, the question of the chosen people, the covenant with God, which was the term used in South Africa, a land which is virtually empty, and this was the history I learned in my school days, long time ago in South Africa, that the whites actually came there into a wilderness and we know what the term used by Zionists for former Palestine was, uh, a land without people, for a people without a land. It's that similar worldview, the view of themselves, and it's colonialism, it's settler colonialism. The most important similarity is the dispossession of people's, indigenous people's land. And with that, their loss of their rights, their birthright. And this is why South Africans see such similarity between the plight of Palestinians who have lost their land and been uprooted and then treated in the most ghastly way. The colonial measures, very extreme, getting extremer. These are similarities in South Africa, uh, as apartheid in particular was implemented under British colonial rule and the Dutch before. Uh, of course, there was colonial brutality and all those measures and the question of race separation, but it's a part of where it comes much more extreme. In practice, there is little difference between the apartheid of South Africa and apartheid Israel. Professor of international law and a South African himself, John Dugard spells it out. Israel discriminates against Palestinians in the West Bank and East Jerusalem in favour of half a million Israeli settlers. Its restrictions on freedom of movement manifested in countless humiliating checkpoints, resemble the pass laws of apartheid. Its destruction of Palestinian homes resembles the destruction of homes belonging to blacks under apartheid's Group Areas Act. Israel has gone beyond apartheid South Africa in constructing separate and unequal roads for Palestinians and settlers. There were many political prisoners on Robben Island, but there are more Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli jails. Apartheid South Africa seized the land of blacks for whites. Israel has seized the land of Palestinians for half a million settlers. <laughs>